we've made some good progress <clears throat> in the previous three hour-long videos I've done as part of this set of six we've covered destiny we've covered life after life and we've covered the bicameral mind the history of the human race the history of the development of mind and make no mistake the model for minds that we're using for humans is built is built upon the model of mind for animals so just as the human race is split into two sexes two genders I believe that's reflective not just of a bicameral mind I believe that's reflective of the three dimensions of the universe beyond the obvious external dimensions to the fundamental truth of truth goodness and chance or fate the reflection of gender is true throughout the animal kingdom and has been for the history of the animal kingdom and reflects the tendency for truth and goodness to marry up we've taken giant steps in the in the previous three videos and it's been very exciting there's no reason for people not to take those giant steps and explore them fully for themselves but it's not something everybody would want to do and what I want to do is to having established that it's possible I now want to slow us down a little bit and look in more detail at some of the areas so that we can see the benefits as opposed to the disadvantages of a, a view which quite simply I think is true but I anticipate it would be a long long time before somebody else would say to me I think it's true as well let's get ourselves on the same page by starting off with a quick trip through destiny so we've posited the question that life generally to most people seems to be either a series of lessons a learning process or a rehearsal a, a, a preparation process and those two things seem to be not the same thing so one could legitimately pose a further question well which is it I mean is it a classroom or is it a stage is it a performance are there levels of insider information one can one can access the way one plays it plays a game or climbs stairs or steps up through through qualifications to the levels of career or is it about the affection you generate is it about the love you generate is it about is it about how attractive the performance is because to some extent we already know it's cyclical the life birth marriage death life cycle is for humankind as it is for animal kind which is that there's there's no apparent end to it I don't care whether you look forward 10 years 
a hundred years, a thousand years, ten thousand years, ten million years, ten billion years. I think you're seeing the same thing as when you look back over animal life and you see that animals have developed their minds to the level they've reached over tens, hundreds, millions, hundreds of millions of years. That there is one when, when you've reached a certain stage, there is no further at a certain point in the development of a system, the system becomes complete. So in the last three episodes of this six episode series of hour long videos, about the mind, we've taken some giant leaps forward and it's been tremendously exciting. I think it's time to slow it down a little bit because whilst the leaps forward are very exciting for those who can take advantage of them, for other people they're going to be a bit frightening. So let's try and concentrate on the advantages of, of what we've of, of what we've started to consider and then slowly we can build affection for, for these ideas. We've discussed destiny. We started off with destiny. We then went on to life after life and then to past life in the form of the bicameral mind. So we've fleshed out a large part of the picture, but we've left holes. So if we perhaps revisit those areas briefly and perhaps show what I mean. So when we looked at destiny, we proposed two possibilities. One was that life is a journey and the destination is the starting point. So it's a cyclical business and that contrasts to the idea that life is a an opportunity to learn lessons and that there are levels of understanding that one can aspire to and reach and exceed in grasping the, com the complexity of not just life but of self um, and what, what is meant by the individual. I've got a third, I've got a third way to look at it. I'm not sure you're going to like it. The third, the third alternative is that actually life is a dance. It's a dance because it's a dance because at the end of the dance you haven't changed your position and everything that you've learned along the way all the steps that go into the dance have been used by the end of the dance. So in a way, you can't, you can, in a way you can't take it with you. You can't take money with you. You can't take knowledge with you. And you can't take
you can't even take a destination with you because you can't actually go anywhere. And this ties right back to probably the most, probably the most I want to say heaviest, probably the head. <laughs> Heavy man. I do want to say that, even so, I, don't, uh, I wish there was a better way to put it, but the heaviest discovery is that the third dimension is relative and it moves, you don't move. Probably somebody coming a look, probably somebody coming a look, coming across this theory for the first time and being, you know, naturally resistant to it. They probably say, "Well, yeah, I get what you're saying, Martin. I get that you're saying that, um, you know, you've got these external dimensions, and then when they go internally, they become relative. So, you know, you've got this dimension of goodness, which is subjective." You know that's not that's not hard to understand. I don't know why you're making a big deal about it, but that isn't what I'm saying. That's not that, that's not that's not a correct statement. I'm not saying you're a door, and on one side of the door is externality, and on the other side of the door is subjectivity. That's not what I'm saying. And let me illustrate why I would not say that based on evidence. And it's because if you look back at the range of human, uh, human variety, which is what we must do all the time, we must constantly seek to test our theories, our, our uh, theses against the varieties of human experience, because we cannot, we cannot expect, because they're our experiments. So if you do that, if you look back, if you, if you look back across the variety of human experience, what you see is that there have been periods in time and places in, places in the world where people have, for one reason or another, decided that the interior is more interesting than the exterior. So these people have become sages and seers and they've become meditators. So they've voluntarily excluded themselves from the experience of the external world and, and uh, chosen to experience the internal world. I mean, I'm dead serious when I say people have been met, pe there have been uh, places and periods where people have meditated for vast parts of the day, every day, and people have isolated themselves, not just hermits. I mean, a famous phenomenon is pole sitting, where you go and climb a pole and, and, and perch on top of the pole, and that is your world for long, long periods of time. What is fascinating about that is that it's possible. So you can turn inward, you can experience this internal space in preference to experience the external, external space. But that is not what most people choose to do and it's not what I would choose to do, it's not what I would advocate. So the experience of the external world is, is the natural experience. All, there's a completely different re so so yes there's this uh, there's this subjectivity what there's this subjectivity on the other side of the door which has temporarily opened by me inhabiting inhabiting this body with this name but the dimension itself 
is not there is not a change between the external dimension and the internal dimension. That's that's that that's it. You, if you if you if you tell me that's what I'm saying, I'll tell you no, you you misunderstood. If somebody else says tries to put what I'm saying into those words, they've misunderstood what I've said. I'm 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 literally saying this. Whatever you choose for your first two dimensions, whether it's truth and goodness as I have, or whether it's broadness and depth or width or height, whatever you choose for the third dimension, that third dimension is relative. You might say, well, is it 100% relative? Is it 100% subjective? Because in that case, it's hard to see how it can exist. I mean, you say goodness, I mean, well, <clears throat> I don't want to uh, argue I don't want to argue falsely against myself any any more than I want to, any more than I want to uh, be represented falsely. So there's no point in making an argument out of it. The assertion that no, the observation is that there is this third dimension. At least fifty percent of it is subjective, and that is a that is an observable phenomenon, which can be identified and recognised repeatedly in many different ways. Whether it's whether it's through a better understanding of time than time stream, whether it's through a better understanding of space through gravity. I don't I don't know why I've done that. I don't mean that, I mean gravity whether it's a better understanding of space through a better understanding of gravity. Or whether it's a better understanding of mind through realising that that third dimension is moving, but you're not. There's no way to change the position that... that is part of the essence of whatever is fundamental to you. Again, somebody could say, well, I've looked at your work, Martin, I get what you're saying. You're saying that heaven is in the sun. You're saying that we come from and go to the sun because that's the most logical place for heaven and you can't go there physically, so that makes sense. So I get that you're saying that you kind of have this location in the sun, which you're saying doesn't move. Um, well... You know, if that's what you want, if that's what you think, that's what you think. But why would somebody else think that? If somebody said that to me, I'd, well, I hope I'd be honest enough to say you're uncomfortably close because I wish I didn't. You're uncomfortably close to what I find to be the most. Um, the easiest to comprehend even though I know it's a little bit ridiculous what's not ridiculous is that mind is not when, when so so rather than so rather than 
proposing that mind is a thing in this invisible, unseeable place. What's <clears throat> What's more helpful is to explain why that's not even the question to ask, let alone the answer. And the reason it's not the question to ask is because if you ask a quest, if you if you ask the obvious question. So the obvious question is, you're proposing a theory of mind. Well, what is this mind? What is this mind that you're proposing made up of? Is it made up of? A, um, is, it, is it a thing in space? Is it an area of space? You know, what are you, what are you, what are you saying? It's, uh, it's. How are you saying we can visualize its, how it's constituted? So that's a, that's a, that's the obvious question to ask. It's also completely the wrong question to ask, and the reason is because. It's already been answered by somebody else. Now, in the late the late sixties, Edward de Bono wrote a book called *The Mechanism of Mind*. For me, that was the book that completely answered my version of that question. So let me explain what I understood Edward de Bono to be saying in that book. What he was saying is that. If you look at it from a medical point of view, bear in mind de Bono had trained as a doctor before he became famous as a philosopher and a, uh, and a lateral thinker. De Bono was saying that if you look at the mind biologically, the way these neurons work and the way they connect and everything, you can see it as being a pattern forming strata it's neither solid nor gas it's it's malleable it's soft it's recordable it's an interface between those two things so if you say is the mind hard or soft the answer is both if you say what's it made of the answer is it's not made of a thing it's not you, that's not the way. That's not. That's not a. That's not a question that can have any way forward. So. So, scientists have um, have arrived at the same uh, point in in understanding because they have the concept of plasticity. But what I've never seen is I've never seen the origin of plasticity. I've never seen a scientist say, and the reason the mind is so plastic is because it is this interface between gas and steel. We use the metaphor, the mind, uh, he's got a mind like a steel trap. We use the metaphor He's got a memory like a sponge. You know, we use these hard, soft, liquid, gas, metal analogies all the time without thinking, without thinking of it in the whole. And scientists use this term plasticity all the time without acknowledging, in my, in my experience, without acknowledging that what plasticity comes from, the only thing it can come from, is that there is this non-specificity about the material that the mind, even though it's, it's like a, something you write on, which obviously is a, a thing, so it looks like it's a thing, but it's not a thing because of this infinite spectrum of what you can record. Do you know, I put that rather well, I think.
let's talk about truth. Let's talk about truth. I've got a profound understanding of what I'm putting forward. And the thing that gave me such a passion to do it, one of the key things that happened to me that gave me such a passion to do it, was in relation to Edward de Bono. I started reading Edward de Bono's work, which isn't, isn't really anywhere near as well known as it deserves to be. So sometimes you've got, you're trying to read an explanation. Most of the time the explanations are very clear because de Bono's writing for, he's writing to make people understand and he's writing to a certain level of person. So the last thing you're going to get is deliberate obfuscation. But sometimes it's a bit, it's not totally easy to grasp the, the, the concept in the whole. So what I started doing was I thought, I think I see what's being said here, but let me put it into my own words. Let me just write down what I think he's trying to say and then see, compare that against what I've read and see where the discrepancies are. And that turned out to be extremely powerful. And one of the ways in which it was powerful was when you express the idea better, in your opinion, better than the person you've just read, whose idea it is, then you start to get a little bit enthusiastic because it's, a, it's, a, it's then a shared thing. It's not his and, you, and you've got to... It's then a shared thing. You've got the creator and then you've got the user and it's a two-way street rather than just being a giver and a receiver. I really like, when I talk about truth, I'd really like that to be the most uppermost thing in people's minds. The thought that what I'm saying is fact. It's no more, no less. And how would the listener, how would the hearer feel about them saying that? How would you feel about retweeting what I've... I'm, 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 the, I'm unlikely to tweet anything ever. But how would you feel about retweeting what I've said or, or, or tweeting it? What words would you use to put forward what to me is a stone cold hard fact? So that's, that's the context. Now, now one of the things I've done is to put myself on record as I've gone along. It's not as easy as I wish it could be to put yourself on record. The way I did it was to record some YouTube videos and I thought well if I can point to that because they've been created on a certain date if in the future I can point to those and say well those were uh, me putting myself on record because they're my thoughts at the time and can't have been changed since I thought that's the best I can do it's not perfect but it's the best I can do so if we go back two three years will see me reaching the point where I realise that I'm now moving forward into a space where really I need to spontaneously pin myself down and say, you know, this is, uh, this is what I think. And I am not go I am not, I am denying myself permission to go to, um, to, to, um, move the goalposts. We all know, we all know what, 
we all know how easy it is in an argument to move the goalposts. And I wanted to put myself in a situation where those go goalposts couldn't be moved either by me or by anybody else. And that's why I started putting myself on record. Now, the reason why I refer back to that now is because I did it on the basis of truth. So I said, truth appears to be grains. And so the problem we've made for ourselves is having this mountain of grains, which cannot you can't build upon because it's like a it's like a sandcastle. You add more and more and more on the top and it just falls down the sides. It's the wrong approach to truth. This was and the context of this was that I had I was uh, convinced that philosophy, which is the study of truth, had made no progress in 2000 years. And I'd become convinced that it's because Plato was being misdescribed. So Plato was not wrong at the time, but describing Plato as 100% right now is m mis uh, um, is misrepresenting the, the m misrepresenting the truth, and it is it is miseducating you and me about truth. So I said, and this is on record, take one step backwards, throw out this idea of a, of a cave and start again with a line, a dimension, a dimension of truth. What I want to do now, today, here, is to take 10 steps forward based on that one step backwards. And what I'm um, what I'm promising you is that you will see that that 10 steps forward is consistent with everything I've said so far, but also takes it significantly further forward. And as I said, those are 10 what I think of as facts. I don't think I own them, I don't think I created them, I don't think I'm explaining them, I think I'm identifying them. And anybody can identify a truth at any time. Let's, let's describe these 10 points. Well, the description is truth first 2,000 years, a common, a common uh, technique of identifying a very simple set, a very simple um, uh, grabby soundbite uh, in with which to, um, it, with, with, with which to uh, trap attention. So we're going to have 10 points. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. first point of those things that I've already mentioned, the first point, the starting point, is philosophy equals nothing over 2,000 years. Why is that? We're going to answer the question, how do we take it forward? We're going to take it forward.
number two. Truth. It's not explained properly. Let's take Plato's idea of a cave. So Plato is saying truth is like a fire burning in the middle of a cave, um, uh, casting light everywhere. But then he goes on to say, but it's more than that. It's more as if truth was not the light, but the shadows within the light. It's as if the shadows on the walls that are constantly moving are the truth. And you can see the shadows because you can see the contrast against the light. But you can't actually see the, f the fire. It's as if you had your back to it. This was Plato's idea. But as we've seen, that doesn't encompass the full range of what truth is. It doesn't explain why you get these grains, these nuggets of hard truth. And the, uh, the evidence of that is science, because science is based on provable truth, hard truth. So this nebulous, gaseous truth that Plato has identified and is, and is uh, sometimes put forward as the be all and end all as a definition of truth is not complete. So what's a better metaphor for, for teaching what truth is? Well, here's a simple one. Dimension is one, obviously, it's the one I've been using for 30 years, but that's not so simple. That there's a deeper, uh, a deeper that's deeper than it appears as a way of grasping truth. What's a nice, simple, easy way to understand Plato, science, and me? Here's one way. Matter has multiple states. It has solid, liquid, and gaseous. Plato's cave describes what you might call gaseous truth. Science, proof-based, describes what you might call solid proof. But there's this whole area of intermediate proof, some of which is so similar to proof, you can treat it as that. Some of which is so far away from provable that, it, that if you put it forward as truth, you're in danger of being laughed at. People say, oh, it's new age. Oh, it's psychobabble. Oh, it's this, that, the other. Uh, astrology, you know, that's, that's, that's um, fairy dust. Well, I agree, astrology isn't hard. I agree, astrology isn't subject to experimental proofs. But I don't agree, astrology is fantasy even though it's not my cup of tea and I don't, I don't have any knowledge of it. The majority of the universe is not gaseous. The majority of the universe is not solid. Liquid is not the majority of the universe, but it is a substantial proportion of matter. It's the same with truth. So 
this area of truth needs to be at least as well understood as this area of truth and this area of truth. So when I say truth is not explained properly, what I mean is the group does not have this shared, uh, complete understanding of truth. And the bizarre thing is, it thinks it does. So we have, as you know as well as I do, we have at the moment this idea of post-truth. That's how confident we are about our understanding of truth, that we would, as a group, believe that we are on the verge of being post-truth. Let's come back to philosophy, which has made <clears throat> Let's come back to philosophy. So what is the problem with philosophy? What is the problem that philosophy has had, which has held it back? What is the um, the gag, the, 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 the wrist binding that has kept philosophy almost um, crippled for this long period of time. How would we have used this if we had known about it over the last 2,000 years? My... my <coughs> My clearest understanding is that what is that philosophy has been crippled by being trying to be provable. What philosophy has tried to do ever since Plato is to remove assumption. somehow get behind assumption, take away assumptions and get behind it and underneath it to a fundamental proof. Is it turtles all the way down? The, the mistake, the, the the misassumption here was that assumption is somehow is, is somehow a bad thing but assumption is not per se a bad thing because all of us are assuming all the time and if you have if you are using a particular assumption and you come across a fact that means that assumption is not correct and that you can therefore come up with a new assumption you can take that assumption out and replace it with an improved assumption. No damage done, no harm done. You have not changed anything that matters. All you've done is make an improvement. And you can do that as much as you like. These, these you might, you might think of it as premises. You might, you might think that, um, oh, well, I started off with this premise, but I now want to change that to be this premise. How can, I, how can I do that and be consistent? Well, if this premise is a better premise than this premise, what it, how is there a problem? It would only be if you had made an incorrect, if you had believed an incorrect fact based on a starting premise, 
that was then proven wrong by your improved premise, then you'd have a problem. But the problem would be the fact that was incorrect, not the premise. These, these assumptions that we use, they're all separate from each other. They're all separate from each other. If you, if you take, uh, let's see if I can think of a good example. My assumption is I won't be ill in three weeks time and therefore I'm going to go and book some holidays or, or whatever I need to do. In two weeks time I become ill. It's now much much more likely that I'm going to be ill in three weeks time. So my assumption that I'm not going to be ill in three weeks time needs to be modified but it's not inconsistent to replace that assumption. I'm not, I'm not changing any premise that I've used to, to, to build upon. I'm just, I'm just using a different assumption if I want to. And that assumption that I won't be ill in three weeks, that's nothing to do with my assumption as to whether I'll be alive in two years or whether I'll have enough money to retire on in five years or whether people like me or whether I'll get married. Because we all spend most of our thinking time juggling contradictions, we are constantly updating and replacing assumptions anyway, all the time. So we're not, we're not anywhere close to a post-truth situation. And in fact, a better description for us to be using at this point in time in order to emphasise this huge un unexplored area, a better assumption would be to call it pre-truth. The first two thousand years of the discover the first two thousand years of the study of truth and the practice of philosophy has been an era of pre truth. I've got slightly ahead of myself because I was carried away I forgot that all assumptions are replaceable is actually point number six not point number four as well which brings me to point seven which brings me back to point seven and point seven is to revisit point two OK, so it turns out that for the last 2,000 years, for the whole of my lifetime, for the whole of your lifetime, truth has not been explained properly. Does it matter? One way in which it does not matter in the slightest is that you know what the truth is without having somebody to tell you. You know the truth when you hear it. It doesn't mean that prove 
doesn't mean that proofs are superfluous. Proofs are by no means superfluous because you might recognise truth when you hear it, but that doesn't mean you understand it. Here's a silly example. There's a famous equation in maths, e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0. Well, I recognise the truth of that, you can, you can bet, but I don't understand it, you can bet that as well. So, there's no, there's no, uh, there's nothing to worry about here. This is fascinating and wide-reaching and great fun for those of us able to have this fun, but it's not worrying, it's not depressing, it's not disturbing, it's not sinister, it's none of those things. If we had have studied this area of liquid truth, we would be rather less, I want to say gullible, I'm not sure if I'd get away with that, we would be rather better protected against some of the, um, some of the ways in which we kind of get um, influenced. A good example is rhetoric. Now I know that's a real old-fashioned word, word, but it's still the case, and you can see it all around you, that the, the, the sound bite, the pithy phrase, the The coinage, the, 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 the hitting the nail on the head, the, the, the putting it into words, carries inherent power. So lockdown, fake truth. No. Nope. So lockdown, fake news. Um, Rumsfeld's known unknowns. There are lots and lots of times where a, where a particular phrase resonates widely and then be, gains a power and an impetus in its own right. Understanding, and I'm going to write it down, Understanding rhetoric is the basis for managing and not getting over-influenced by these powerful but non-provable elements of truth. And of course, the culmination of rhetoric is... argument. And one of the biggest step forwards in philosophy for the last 2,000 years is, guess what? The argument sketch by Monty Python. By humorously pointing out the inevitability of moving the goalposts the polarisation, the extreme polarisation of 
two alternative viewpoints trying to um, trying to beat the other one into submission. The whole and De Bono, uh, De Bono says exact, exactly the same thing, much more, um, much more cogently, that the whole I am right if you are wrong, you must be wrong for me to be right, that whole way of thinking is wrong-headed. We live in a world where we're all juggling contradiction, paradox, therefore... It's perfectly possible that you could be right and I could be right. We're not, if, we, if we're in doubt about that, the only way we can ever resolve the doubt is by seeking proof experimentally. So by following that thinking through coolly rather than humorously, what I conclude is that the place for argument is on the written page where you can follow the argument through from beginning to conclusion should you want to. You can leave at any time, you can stop at any time and come back to it later. But the place for the place for The place for two people discussing, discussing something, that's not the place for argument. The place for two people discussing something is the place for questions. And what you do when you're discussing something which, you, which, which either of you doesn't understand fully, what you do is you ask a question because you've become interested now in the answer. You answer the question if you're asked and you notice if the other person takes the answer on board and you don't then say, oh, I see that you have taken. You don't then say. And furthermore, because of X, Y, you see, I was right all along. You don't do that. It's not. In, it's, it, it's absolutely not. Uh, It's absolutely not advantageous to you if somebody agrees with you or not. If somebody disagrees with you, that's absolutely fine. Maybe they've got facts that they haven't shared with you yet that mean that you disagree with you if you knew the facts. It's, it's not about the point of the argument. It's not about the proof of the argument. It's about the facts. It's always about the facts. What facts have you got that I haven't got? If you haven't got any facts that I haven't got, I'm sorry, I'm going to likely get a bit bored a bit quickly. But facts are not proven. Facts are things that are not yet unproven. That's a fact. So, quite honestly, that's where we end up with. That's where we end up at. It turns out, if philosophy is ever going to be anything more than pre-truth, sorry, pre-truth, it turns out it's going to have to start building up a body of facts. Which you and I can either agree with or not disagree with. And if philosophy does do that, if there are a set of facts that correspond to a philosophy, then the only way you're really going to be able to say, well, I'm sorry, I don't agree with those facts. The only way you're going to be able to say that, you know, you, the only way you're going to be able to say that and have it mean anything 
is if you have an alternative philosophy. That's the end result of this. I've been looking for a philosophy all my life. You have a choice. I've been looking for a philosophy all my life. Unfortunately, I think... <clears throat> I've been looking for a philosophy all my life. I've now found one. I'm happy with the philosophy I've got. I'm happy to develop it. I'm happy to take on board facts that contradict it. Perfectly happy with that. Doesn't alter the fact I put myself on record. Job done. I'm not going to pretend I haven't succeeded in doing what I, what I set out to do. And therefore, somebody else is now not seeking a philosophy, they're either seeking this philosophy or they're seeking an alternative philosophy. That's the name of the game. As we enter the next 2000 years of, I suggest, two philosophies. There's got to be a Pepsi and there's got to be a Coke. In episodes four and five of this series of hour-long videos, I'm going to be talking about the difference between you and you. The individual you and the group you. And the difference between what is visible from the appearance so your name, your age, your physical appearance, and what is endemic in the spiritual you that has had previous lives, will have future lives, but has this life to contend with. One of the things I've said about people who are talking on this subject, fellow gurus, I might, I might aspire to say, is that a guru who only has something to say about the individual is somewhat limited in their appeal, whereas somebody who has something, somebody like Edward de Bono, who has something to say to not just the individual, something practical, but something to say to people as a whole, something philosophical is in a much stronger position. So one of the things that doesn't appeal to me in the modern uh, <coughs> Eckhart Tolle um, uh, mind, mind view that, for instance, greatly appealed to my brother, uh, doesn't appeal to me because it seems to me it says everything to you, the individual, and nothing to you, the wider, the wider, the wider situation. This idea of living in the moment is, uh, has a limited distance to travel because it's something that it seems like you can only do individually or if a bunch of you are going to do it, they can kind of do it at the same time. It, it doesn't have more meat to it than that, so it's, uh, it's, it's got a limited um, degree of application. So I hope to do better than that, 
and one of the strengths that I can bring is that I can talk in terms of a diagram, not just words. Here's the diagram I've got in mind. Because when I wrote a book about the idea I had, I wrote it as a philosopher investigating the logical significance of the idea. I was able to take it as far as um, I was able to take it as far as I believe it was possible to go in that direction, but I couldn't necessarily have produced a diagram like this, and there is no diagram like this in the book, or rather there are there are diagrams which recognise the need for a diagram like this. There are references to it that recognise the need for this diagram, but this diagram is the end result of not having to have a diagram but wanting one. So let's see why I think this diagram is so powerful. Um, we have the standard idea of three dimensions of mind, which is the idea that I had when I was 27 and have been pursuing for the second half of my life. Three dimensions of mind, which is already a well-known, well-established idea from Freud back to if you like, back to the uh, Holy Trinity. So the child, the inner child, is spontaneous, natural, unaffected, and um, the essential you. The adult is the moral, intellectual, um, reasoning component, which is uh, which is responsible for our intellect as opposed to our emotion. And then of course there's the spiritual element, which is the, the legacy of our ancestors, still, still present in our own minds. And our minds are, uh, our minds are in a relationship with other minds that is similar to the relationship of a hand within a glove, but much, much more difficult to distinguish. So it is, it is, it is literally not possible to peel off one layer from another within the mind. Uh, so the, um, the cooperation between minds is, is what has been built up over tens, hundreds, thousands of thousands of years, literally millions of years, uh, in fact literally billions of years, I mean literally it's, it's the whole of life that has built up this, this uh, mechanism of mind. Now, so that's, that's what the book's about and that's what the book explores and it takes it to a, a, a logical conclusion. Where we go one step beyond uh, is where we have the green sections, the green sections being the new arrival, in this case me. So within the adult, my, my individual mind is actually wholly contained within others, others' minds. So I'm, there is no way for me to distinguish myself from the uh, the mechanism of cognition, which is what the adult is doing. It's, it's cognition that's going on. It's not quite the same in the child. I do have a child that is separate from other children, but it's permanently separated. So the fact that I know it makes no difference. I am, I cannot affect the knowledge makes no difference because I am, I am just me. There's nothing I can do about it, up to a point. And then in the spiritual um, element, in the spiritual area, we have a very slight difference compared to the other two, which is that my mind 
literally is a impermeable barrier. So although I, although my brain needs the presence of other minds for it to work, my essential meanness is is never compromised. I I I couldn't even if I wanted to um, blur the meaning of what is me. Let's see the reality of this practically. So the examples I've got are uh, hypnosis, drinking, so psychoactive substances, drinking, smoking, and would you believe eccentricity, quirkiness. So in a spiritual situation in, in a, on a spiritual basis what is evident in the personality that sees itself as different as as not automatically the same as what it appears to be a, a, a person that manifests their own kind of judgment can appear to somebody else from outside can appear eccentric the very word eccentric identifies the off-centre nature of this necessity of being. So just one very small example, but intuitively, uh, it's intuitively appealing because it's straightforward, it's almost elegant. Similarly, hypnosis, the logic of hypnosis confounds understanding the very the very logic of hypnosis defies cognition which is actually pretty clever and although it's quite it can be quite um, um, disconcerting to uh, come across what happens to people when they're hypnotized how they behave although that can be quite disconcerting actually it shouldn't be, it should be the opposite, it should be quite, or not comforting, but certainly reassuring, because it's an, there's an element of humanness there. The very fact that it makes no sense how people believe, it's not true that it makes no sense, but it, it is true that it doesn't make the sense that you would expect. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not sensible although uh, although there's an element of making people appear foolish through hypnosis for entertainment purposes in actual fact that's not without uh, that's not without implications um, and I mean you know it's on the press it's 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 in the press it's on the internet uh, it, it, it's a matter of record Lastly, psychoactive substances, well, they're uh, obviously uh, clearly more about the, the, the child than the parent or the adult. These are the names, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned it, for the uh, cognitive component versus the uh, spiritual component in, in transactional analysis. And by the way, there's, I should acknowledge there's some debate about which is which, but not for me. I, I, I think... I think uh, debate is for uh, uh, another time. So, psychoactive substances, which are which are uh, which are um, directly affecting the uh, experience of the child, are things like drinking um, and smoking. Now, drinking is an obvious example where you immediately become effectively more you in a kind of an isolated way. Your cognition is significantly worse. Your spiritual um, uh, sense, your spiritual um, sensitivity is, is significantly dulled, but you are, you are freed from your inhibitions to be more spontaneous and so on, up to a point. So drinking is an obvious, obvious example. 
But what's interesting about, about the mind, which has so many complexities, is that smoking is kind of the corollary of drinking. So whereas smoking, whereas drinking increases, uh, in, increases um, spontaneity and so, so on and so forth, um, smoking does the opposite. It actually uh, reduces anxiety and um, uh, increases um, I almost want to say it increases phlegmaticism. Um, it gives you it gives you a more philosophical outlook. Um, and uh, I speak as an ex-smoker who 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 very much appreciates you know what it was able to do for me. Um, and as a current drinker, um, I can only say I know which would be my preference or, or everything being equal. This is the diagram I want us to work up to, but that's for the next episode in this series of videos. At the moment, I want to make it, I want to, I want to make the simplest possible introduction to you uh, of yourself. So let's discuss mental health versus mental wealth. We've got as far as recognising that truth can be not just identified as a dimension, uh, so um, uh, the metaphysical can be cross-referenced with the physical. It can be recognised in terms of three states of matter. So there is a, 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 a different mapping between the metaphysical and the physical, which we can find useful. Now, this was what I was able to take advantage of when I wrote my book because I was able to cross-reference continually back and forth from one to the other and use each to illuminate the other. What I didn't do at that time was to make use of this particular cross-reference. I was very much focused on, on the, the idea of a dimension and I have been for most of, the, most of the time, that's been all I've needed. But now that I'm getting a, a, a broader understanding I, I can see the advantages of having an alternative to dip into. What I want to do is to introduce yourself to you in terms of the adult. So now this is a fundamental psychological model of mind divided up into a parent component, an adult component, and a child component, which, corris which, which correspond in my thinking to three dimensions of mind. The adult component is 
the intellectual side of you. So it's the easiest one to understand and it's the first one to understand. It's not like a computer, but for the purposes of um, for the purposes of discussion, we can see it as being a, a Spock-like element uh, of personality. <clears throat> so if we draw two boxes, one to represent physical matter, one to represent metaphysical matter, and we map across, so we have solid, liquid, gas, that would map across to conscience, cognition, i.e. reasoning, and recognition. Conscience is, behaves like a solid. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's say you are um, a happy, happy-go-lucky young kid um, or teenager and uh, you um, uh, appreciate the advantages of pocket money, you see some money lying around, it's not yours, but you think nobody will know if I, no, nobody will know if I pocket that, nobody will know if I pinch that. So you take it, and sure enough, nobody realises. And a little voice in the back of your head says, that wasn't really the right thing to do, how would you like it if somebody did that to you? And you, and you react, however you react. Maybe you say, oh, I don't care. Or maybe you say, okay, well, even though, even though I recognise I don't have to, I am going to own up and give this money back or just, just put it back. The first time, you have complete freedom of choice. What happens if you do it a second time? What happens if the money is available there to be taken and you pocket it and that little voice in the back of your head says, that's not the right thing to do. And you say, I don't care. I, 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 I've got loads. I, I can buy happiness. Which is an argument. Well, what happens is that little voice shuts down. You don't hear that voice anymore. And what's happened within your mind is that and what is effectively an infinite space, which is the conscience, within that infinite space, a door has closed. And that door will not open again. You might be able to go around it, you might not have to go through the door. But unfortunately for you, that door doesn't just tell you when you've done wrong it also turns out to be quite useful for deciding under difficult situations what the right thing to do is. So don't do it, don't go against your conscience. You don't need me to tell you that, you wouldn't be here if you didn't think that already. And indeed, it's, a, it's, it's becoming a commonplace, this, not a, not a surprise. So solid conscience, that's been how it's been all the way through. So nothing new there. Cognition is just cognition is just normal reasoning. It's the it's the act of juggling uh, well <clears throat> it's the act of following through a train of thought and in actual fact most of the time it's, an, it's the act of juggling between contradictions. We all of us spend most of our time managing the fact that we don't have enough information and what we certainly don't have is certainty. So 
Contradiction is the natural state of being, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, whether you're in love, whether you're um, pursuing uh, art, whatever you're doing. So that's, that's fine. We, we're free, we're, we have complete freedom of thought. Between cognition and conscious lies recognition. Now, I say that is a liquid because it is, um, it is uh, changeable. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a ductile thing. A ductile element of of truth. Um, I really only need one example uh, of this and I'm going to slightly cheat by using an example which is drawn from my own experience not because um, not because that's necessarily uh, uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt but just because it is uh, a natural a natural choice to make Where I, I spent a lot of time reasoning, a lot of time doing this. I hadn't had much help with it in the sense that I hadn't been pushed down or pulled down a certain path where, it, where I didn't feel I had a choice. I feel most of the time I've done what anybody would do uh, under those circumstances. Where I perhaps did feel that I, I was doing something that or uh, was in a situation which other people wouldn't uh, which other people wouldn't automatically find themselves in was when I bumped into a guy in my school uh, out of the blue and had the oddest feeling of uh, deja vu, uh, the feeling that um, of all the people I'd met so far and all the people in my family and uh, all the experiences I had, this was one person who I was somehow connected to. And it's a person who I then became friendly with and stayed friendly with and uh, I would say uh, I came to um, I came to value very highly um, uh, as a person very different to me, but also uh, um, very much somebody I could rely on. I'd be the first, I'd be the last to argue with anybody who said that alcoholism is an illness. I'd be the last to argue with anybody who said drug addiction is an illness. What I do think is that the difference between an illness and those things is that you cannot impose a cure. Once somebody has ended up uh, in that situation, the only way they can leave that situation is through their own conscious choice and help. So help on its own cannot save them. 
and there is this element of mental health there is this catch-22 about it you remember catch-22 was essentially if you're ill enough to want to leave the war then by definition you're healthy because that's a healthy thing to want to do there's a catch-22 in mental health which is that although mental health although mental illness is a reality there is also the same element of personal choice which has to be has to be um, recognized and it's that more than anything else which is why we do need a theory of mind because we cannot have a mental health industry which is based on chemistry that's not help that's not that's counterproductive that's all i need to say about that because i'm not in the mental health industry i'm no expert i just have a lot of opinions um, what i do want to move on to is mental wealth so this i think is of interest So mental wealth is the knowledge of self and the knowledge of others. This is not a this is not a form of wealth that can be carried around in money. It is a form of wealth which can translate to happiness. And that's important because that means it's a form of wealth that does not end immediately the second you die, unlike money does or should. knowledge of self knowledge of others does not necessarily come easily it has to be earned a bit like my example of recognition what is actually going on there is not memory in the form of words which is what we're used to you know when you remember a fact you remember it in the form of words and it's those words that you actually that actually correspond to the fact for you if you can't access the words it's the same to all intents and purposes as not being able to access the the fact when i recognized my friend which is how i thought of it at the time i didn't have any there were no there there were no words other than recognition um i I've no idea who he was, I've no idea what our relationship was. These are, um, these are very, very well explained in my view by Edward de Bono's Mechanism of Mind book, which identifies how the mind records patterns and it's those patterns that are um, that the, that are the history of the mind, almost like habits. So, whoever this person was, I had habituated to to his personality as he had to mine, and knowledge of self is knowledge of one's own habituation knowledge of others is knowledge of how people habituate to people on the wider scale 
these patterns are learned over time. They're acquired over time and they don't get lost except over a long, long time. And that's why they automatically go with one over, over a lifetime or more. And just as and just as you have a vast memory available to you, so you have a vast ability to record patterns and, and retain patterns. So knowledge of self can be, for want of a better word, limitless. Knowledge of others, likewise. I don't have examples of that because actually what that does is it takes me into a new area which is my knowledge compared with my knowledge as an expert compared with other people's knowledge as experts so let's take the next step De Bono has something called Thinking Tools. I'm a big fan of this work. I'm a big fan of the idea of a practical outcome from uh, approaching the, the ideas of think. I'm a big fan of these, of this approach that is practical and uh, there are two ideas that I think are particularly interesting. Uh, so De Bono is obviously famous for his six hats um, approach to uh, cooperative thinking as opposed to the normal, uh, largely competitive, argumentative uh, approach, which uh, which is widely admired under the, uh, under the guise of critical thinking. I think that there's a, an equally admirable form of th thinking, which is constructive thinking, which doesn't, doesn't, doesn't yet get the appreciation it should. So uh, De Bono's ideas of particular interest are the Six Hats idea, and then the um, cognitive uh, tools idea, which is, again, six tools. Now, six is an interesting number to use because, of course, three dimensions with uh, which uh, each dimension has two ends. That gives you uh, two times three is six. So there's a significance to the number six, which uh, which is of great interest in, in, in correctly separating and, uh, and correctly categorizing. So uh, <clears throat> the six hats idea is colored hats, which are 
are directions of thought. So you are thinking in a certain way when you, when you wear one of these thinking hats. So it's a very simple idea which can be used by groups and is widely used. So I'm led to understand. I've not had the chance to use it myself, except in a very limited circumstance. Um, the six cognitive tools are similar. Uh, generally two or three letter acronyms which identify a particular way of thinking which an individual can use and I'll just mention two examples because these are uh, these have struck me as particularly interesting because they are examples that one can use alone They're, that one doesn't require a team to, to, to put them into use uh, the two examples are um, PMI and AGO. So AGO stands for Aims, Goals, Objectives. Now, uh, <clears throat> thinking about one's goals, thinking about one's objectives, is very much adult type thinking, in, not in the sense of grown up, but in the sense of the adult component, it's rational, logical, linear thinking. So uh, one, of the, one of the experiences I've had over time is that I've uh, found that that's a particularly useful um, it's particularly useful to apply that kind of thinking when in a non-emotional um, situation. So, for example, one might well, you know, have a beer and brainstorm some creative marketing ideas, uh, come up with as many ideas as possible, some of which might actually be usable. Uh, with an AGO, an Aims, Goals, Objectives, you want the opposite. You want, uh, you want to be engaged in a, in a physical task, a difficult physical task. For example, I go swimming once a week for an hour and I just swim lengths up and down for an hour and it's very dull and not very pleasant. I don't look forward to it. However, what I do look forward to is having done it because that is a great feeling. Um, and what I noticed was that that's an ideal opportunity to be mulling over problems, solutions, and uh, and how to get from where you are to where you want to be. So very much objective focused. That's one example, a completely different example. Uh, I have been in a situation where um, one's natural um, approach is argumentative. I've been in many situations, many relationships where um, there was a comp an intellectually competitive element in the partnership and the, uh, the, it did lead to argumentative situations. Um, one of the tools that I found genuinely helpful in such a situation was PMI, which stands for plus minus interesting. So the idea is that instead of what you normally do, which is to take a new idea and look at all the good things about it and all the bad things about it and have a to and fro between the two. Instead of doing that, you look at it three ways. So you look at it in terms of the good idea, so that's the plus, in terms of the bad idea, that's the minus, but completely separately you look for the things that are interesting about the idea and in fact you try to make those the thing that matter the things that matter about the idea so it'll have some pluses it'll have some minuses but what's interesting about it is the interestings and that's and that's a way to avoid a a me versus you discussion and have a me and then you discussion. So taking it in turns and, and with a shared, uh, a, a, a 
a shared uh, final outcome. Which brings me to one of the great strengths of De Bono's work, which is that he's one of the first people to say to me, um, avoid argument, don't go there. It's not useful, it's not helpful. People have a natural tendency to think that criticising other people makes them look good. People have a natural tendency to think that the other person losing an argument means they win an argument. Of course, when you have an argument in front of an audience, it's a lot more obvious that that's not the case. What you're trying to do when you have an, when you when you have a when you have two sides of a debate discussed in front of an audience, it's much more obvious that what the audience wants to see is they want to see the ground covered. They want to see legitimate points being made fairly and then and then moving on. And what will sway the audience, what will what will provide an eventual outcome at the end, which is either yes, that was a that was a good debate and there was a clear um, a clear side that had a stronger argument, what will, what will sway them is the ground being legitimately and fairly covered, not somebody, uh, not how effectively somebody criticises the other person or belittles their ideas or tries to, um, tries to, um, tries to otherwise undermine their argument. I've already covered in some detail the, the element of plasticity which De Bono was so strong about. Um, I haven't covered so much the element of criticism which is part of this idea about argument. So as well as avoiding argument and stepping away from it and accepting that even when there's no even when there is no audience, it's better to it's better to have a debate as if there was an audience and to have a debate by covering the ground and by making legitimate legitimate points and then moving forward rather than um, rather than trying to be seen to win at the end of the day. That's not an important element. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the great, great conclusions I would add on top of all of this is that I would say that a new idea is like a green shoot. It's like a, it's like a delicate seedling. And what it needs, what it, what it needs to thrive is it needs water, sunlight, care, what it doesn't need is the is what it doesn't need is it doesn't need ruthless pruning. That's that there's a time and a place for that, but it's not when it's a seedling. It's not when it's a new idea. So one of the great, great weaknesses of critical thinking is this principle that as soon as anybody comes up with a new idea you get your saccateurs out and you say well how strong is this idea let's cut it away let's cut it back to its um to it to it to the bare minimum how well does it survive that oh it's dead oh well that couldn't have been a very good idea well it never had a chance to be a good idea when you take this seriously and you do have ideas and some of them aren't good what becomes apparent is that some ideas don't thrive, but other ideas, they need light to thrive. So you have to look at an idea in different lights. You have to look at it in different circumstances. You can't just assume that because in one circumstance it's, 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 it's not, um, it's not, it's not at its most appealing, that therefore that applies in all circumstances. So it's kind of obvious 
but it's good to see it in practice. It's good to realise that that's a general principle, not just something that happens sometimes for one, you know, by by chance. Um, I said that De Bono has this idea of coloured hats and he likes the uh, the principles of threes and sixes. So we can do a similar thing. We can say, hmm, you know, we have the principle of a black lie and we have the principle of a white lie, but then all we have is grey lies. We don't have coloured lies. So, hmm. Why can't we do a de bono on lies? What would happen if we did? What would happen if we said, well, there are, there are types of lie and they have a value which is completely hidden when you just look at them as gray lies. So let's pick some colors, uh, the, kind of, the kinds of colors we usually pick. So we might pick red, uh, purple, uh, yellow and then blue green because we've already got white black so together that gives us four so I've given this a little bit of thought and I've come up with uh, a, a example lies for these different situations. Lies which are, um, they are they are grey lies in the sense that they're not white but they are coloured lies in the sense that they have a legitimacy which we don't want to overlook, we don't want to miss. So let's take two examples of me telling a lie, which I'm, which <coughs> uh, it, it, it's embarrassing to admit to. I'm, I'm ashamed, you know, that that uh, that um, I've been caught in a lie. So um, when I was when I was a teenager, I got run over, and it ended up going to court. And when we were in court, the lawyer asked me, "Did I remember saying it was my fault?" This came as a complete shock to me because, of course, I I realised immediately that I did remember saying that because I was thinking, well, if I'm going to die, I may as well take the, take the blame. Um, I panicked and the only thing I could think to do was to say, no, I don't remember saying that. It was an absolute, um, you know, it, it was a, it was a, there was no time, you know, <clears throat> There was time, there was time, but I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't know any better. And so I just came out, I just blurted this out because I was so embarrassed at the memory. But nevertheless, technically it was perjury. And, um, you know, I was old enough to know the difference between truth and, and falseness. So there was no justification for it, except that I would say, well, hang on a second. That happens far too often and is far too natural for it to be useful to call it a grey lie. So let's call that a red lie. Let's, let's define all red lies as being the lies a child tells which are unnecessary. <clears throat> and let's introduce, let's introduce children to the idea of a unnecessary red lie before it happens to them so that they can be a little bit prepared for when it does. Um,
That's not my best example of a red lie though. I've got, I've got what I think is a better example, which it, uh, when I say better, I mean uh, a bit more embarrassing um, and so better for that reason. Uh, when I was, again, teenage, well, uh, I was a, a bit before, tw be bit before the age of twenty. Around the age of twenty, um, I had to get up early for work because I was being picked up, and. Um, through nobody's fault but mine, I overslept. I completely missed the alarm and woke up to realise that my lift had arrived, knocked on the door, received no answer and driven off. Uh, so I was not going to be able to um, fulfil my, my, my commitment to work that day. I was going to have to go in and um, treat it as a normal normal day. So I went into work and when I was asked what happened I made up this story about having come downstairs that morning and found, found my dad passed out on the, on, the, on the floor at the bottom of the stairs. Made up this story completely out of the blue um, and you know, at the time, was kind of a little bit um, <clears throat> sort of con con consciously having sort of made a decision that it was better to tell a big lie than a little lie. Um, obviously, uh, at the time, I didn't think very much about it. It was only later I thought, well, why did nobody ever ask me what happened to my dad? <laughs> Why did nobody have any interest in uh, in in uh, what happened after this uh, this this terrible terrible story? Uh, and of course, the reason was that everybody knew it was a ludicrous uh, attempt to cover up my my um, horribly um, shameful um, letting the side down. So that's a that's a probably a better example of an actual, not unnecessary lie, but, but a very childish lie at a time when I very much, you know, was old enough to know better. Uh, I, you'll be pleased, I think we'll both be pleased to learn that I don't have any more examples of lies for us. Um, the contrast to my to my contrast to these lies, these types of lies, the examples I've given, are the big lie and the little lie. So the big lie is everything's going to be all right. Now, there's a lot of mileage in, it's not quite a white lie, because a white lie, I think we all know, is does my hair look nice? Your hair looks beautiful. It would look more beautiful if you'd done nothing to it or if you went back to how it was before. You don't say that. You say your hair looks beautiful. That's a genuine white lie. A, a lie of the type everything's going to be all right. Well that's, that's, that's less a lie in the sense of not telling the truth as it is a lie in the sense of withholding the truth by a person who's got more knowledge of the truth than the other person. So for example, if you're flying a plane and the engine goes out and somebody, a passenger, comes in and says, I noticed that the wing's on fire, is everything all right? And you say, everything's absolutely fine, I'm just, I think there's a phrase for it. Um, feathering. I think there's a phrase for it where you feather the engine which is where you um, cut the power to it for a de deliberately and it will sometimes give off smoke uh, as part of that 
I, I wouldn't swear to it, but yeah, so you say, no, everything's fine. I'm just feathering the engine and, uh, you know, there's nothing to worry about. You're the, you're the person who's got the information and you are deliberately withholding it from the person who cannot get the information anywhere other than from you at that, at that point. So that's what you, that's what I would describe as a, a purple lie because it comes from a position of power and authority and knowledge. A little lie and yellow is a good colour to use because it's um, generally it's um, it's the lie that avoids it's a lie to cover up something that you would rather not um, be known so it's 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 sort of one step one step off a black lie it's not harmful but it is dishonest because you 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 just you just you just <clears throat> you just pass off pass over the truth did you forget um, did you forget our anniversary no I didn't forget I and then you just come up with a little lie whereas in fact you did forget so lots of places where a little lie is <coughs> is whilst not by whilst not being totally without blame is a useful uh, piece of um, oiling the machinery. I'm not being cynical here. I'm, I'm, I'm just as idealistic about the truth as anybody. But I don't want anybody telling me the truth because they have to. I want them telling me the truth because they, I, I want them telling me the truth when they want to. That needs to be a considered decision. I don't, I don't want people being bullied into telling the truth and I don't want to be bullied into it myself. I just want it. I want coloured lies because I love because I think lies have a bad reputation, and uh, it's it may. It's there's probably. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a degree of cowardice in my proposing that we call them little lies to some extent. But if so, I'm happy to be, I'm prepared to be pinned down on it. Where I <clears throat> do end up is back at my example in a court of law where I'm... Uh, committing perjury, uh, I think that the one lie that is really not acceptable to be classified as a lie is the blue-green lie, which is what you might call the Fifth Amendment lie. I am not going to answer that question other than with a lie, because to do so would incriminate myself unacceptably. In other words, I don't have any duty to you or anybody else to prosecute myself. I have a duty to be honest when I'm asked, but I don't have any duty to create the case against myself. And it distresses me when I hear people have been uh, have been made to uh, confess um, their own sins um, 
to other people uh, as a, a confession. It, it, the idea of confession is, I think, um, wrong, is um, well. <coughs> I think the idea of confession is infantilizing. I don't think anybody needs to I don't think anybody needs to confess as a matter of habit. I think the possibility of having to confess is enough. So there is no need to force the, the confession out of somebody. The prospect of having to confess is enough, and if the prospect is such, then the person will, will confess. Um, there are times, I think, when the Fifth Amendment gets contaminated with the child, you think, Gosh, if I don't admit this, I'll, I, I'll ne I won't be able to live with myself. Whereas, in fact, other people are thinking, for God's sake, don't tell anybody that because it wasn't your, you know, because it, it so wasn't your fault that it will actually open up wounds that are just only just only now beginning to close. So I think the I think the the, the Fifth Amendment lie is, 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 the, is outside, is actually outside of the category of lies. And that's why it would be a blue lie, because actually it's not really a lie. So that's my thinking. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad to share it with somebody else. I think it's interesting. I think it's unfortunate that De Bono's work is not better known and more widely um, accepted. And I'm happy uh, under those circumstances, under those circumstances, I can hardly complain if my own work is, is not as widely recognised as I'd obviously like it to be. I perhaps wouldn't be much of a lover of truth if I wasn't prepared to tell the truth about myself, even when it's embarrassing or shameful. I perhaps would so be much of a lover of truth if I wasn't prepared to tell the truth my personal life about history, myself, like I have my work even when it's history. embarrassing or shameful. And we, <coughs> so I'm going to very quickly run through, we, we have found a way to kind of pick out the key events from each history. decade. Um, so, and we, <coughs> starting with, we, a we dream have I had when I was found a way to so kind of pick out the key events from each decade, something like that. Um, um, so, where I, starting dreamed with that a statue of God a dream fell I had on my when head I was and broke, up. and I, I have no idea how old I was, remember feeling five, something that, like that. Uh, I'd um, acquired where a whole set of responsibilities dreamed that, that a statue uh, previously of God had. fell on my head and broke. So and a I bit of an odd dream for remember a, for a young child to have. Uh, I'd but it acquired did. a whole set of responsibilities. I, I still think that have a, uh, previously I had an had. effect on my thinking so process. A bit of an odd dream for a for a young child <coughs> to have. They but call it, it being woke. I, I still you think have a you. A radical you realise kind of the wider picture, process. and I think this was a very, very <coughs> extreme version of that. They call it being woke when so, you, um, you know, you 
you realise kind of the wider so picture. Let's, and I think this was a very, very extreme version of that. So, um, so let's put it in terms of decades. So let's so say let's ten. Then obviously, uh, ten to twenty is school, and. So let's put it in terms of I've been decades. asked in the past if so I had trouble at school, ten, if I found school then obviously, difficult, uh, and 10 to 20 the answer is, is very clear, yes, uh, and culminating so much, I've been asked in the past if I had trouble at school, if I found school difficult at the age of 14, and fortunately the answer is very clearly yes, um, but I culminating so much, I remember going to, culminating, um, I remember reading in attempted suicide at the age of thirteen. Jenny not successful. And thinking, well, the um, the but a school I vividly that, that is I remember described going to these and other books. I remember, books remember reading is books like not um, Jennings in, in the same thinking, universe as well, the school the, that I'm in. The, the school um, that, that, that as a result of that, I changed these and other books. And I went to a school where, where some of my friends from primary school had in, gone to. In the same universe um, as the school that I didn't did. make me any better at um, being at school. As a result of that, I changed I, schools. I ended up with and I went to a school where, where no, some of my friends from primary school had gone to. An example of, um, of, um, of, of it didn't make me any better at being at school. Things was that it didn't mean I wrote that an English I, essay I ended up with good about uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, and the Shakespeare play. Made a difference. An example. And my of, um, teacher said, of, of, of "Oh, Martin, this is really good. This could be published." Was that I wrote an to English essay which my response was about uh, Anthony well, and Cleopatra, the Shakespeare play. Well, and and my <coughs> teacher said. Oh, Martin, this is really to, good. To which my response was largely silence. To I, which my response was, uh, well, that to me it wasn't a surprise well, that it was <coughs> enough to be published, because uh, to, to which my response was largely silence. I uh, because of kind of who to I me was, it wasn't a surprise and, um, that it was uh, good enough to be published, because so uh, uh, it, it didn't do me any good. It, 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 it there was no there was no. Because no of benefit kind of to it, was, which is why I didn't react um, at all when I was said, uh, when when that was said. Unfortunately, so this uh, completely it didn't alienated do good my English teacher. But there was no, who, there was no, um, there was no uh, benefit to it, which is why you I know, didn't quite react reasonably at all when, said, um, when that was backed away. Said. And, uh, Unfortunately, and this was completely then alienated my English mutual, teacher, um, in, who um, in my who uh, uh, you know quite reasonably. Um, Back so I made an enemy, uh, and, and, you know, and without then, um, kind without of sort of understanding uh, uh, in in my corner, uh, just just through lack of understanding. So uh, I made an enemy, <coughs> you know, without um, the without sort of understanding uh, the feeling I had in my in my teens and in my twenties. Just just through lack of understanding, extreme discomfort, uh, extreme <coughs> cognitive dissonance. The, I mean, my thought process, uh, the feeling I had in my uh, in my teens, healthy, and in my twenties, um, was one of extreme discomfort, I, extreme I, cognitive dissonance. Sort of thing in my normal train of thought was not as, as being a circle. Uh, healthy, obviously, um, the starting point might not be the same as the end point. But the I, point is, you sort of you, you think of a normal train of thought, whatever, as as whatever. being a circle. <coughs> Obviously, the mechanism point, might not you be start the same train as the thought, end point. You get to the end point, is and you move on to a new train of thought. You, but my my whatever, pattern of thinking, whatever, tended to be a whatever bit like this. <coughs> it would through whatever mechanism kind of spiral you start a train of thought. You get to the to end of it, and you move on to a new train of thought. My, my pattern thought of thinking about you know, self worth like this and, and it, self it value and kind of um, spiral off. To you the know, fundamentally unpleasant areas with, uh, of thought about you know self worth um, and, and and self value. What to do and, in any situation, um, or, or 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 what to do? You know, fundamental anything. problems with um, with um, with. Um, it's not as if I was to do in any situation, victim, or, or I mean, or, or <coughs> what to do about I, anything. Um, um, I was not. Uh, Nicer than other children, I was not. It's not as if I was another children. Particularly a victim. Um, I mean, rather the reverse. 
I I, I um, remember things that I was not day, uh, cringing uh, nicer and, than other children. Um, I was not more and, good than other children. Um, rather the reverse. The, I, I, I remember I'm, I'm pleased that, to be able to, to this report day, that it's as if it's almost as if they happened to somebody um, else. I mean, I have and I. I'm only cringingly embarrassed because even if that was somebody I'm, else, I'd be cringingly I'm embarrassed. I'm pleased to be able to report. Um, it doesn't feel it's like they're mine. It's almost as if they happen to somebody else. I mean, I have. And I feel I, like I don't I'm only cringingly embarrassed, embarrassed because even if that was somebody else, I'd be cringingly and I'm very embarrassed. Happy not to. Um, it um, doesn't feel like they're my memories. It doesn't feel like it was me. And I feel like I don't remember the vast majority of my um, early years. And I'm very drinking pretty to. heavily throughout, um, throughout my twenties, um, but at least I'm working in, in in computers, which is something I can do. And I'm at least I'm drinking you know, pretty sport heavily sport throughout throughout my twenties. Um, uh, but at least I'm working in in computers, a, a bit which a, is something I can a do. Bit of a, um, and at least I'm. You know, playing which is sport, also very valuable, and, and particularly. Uh, but I think if anybody had uh, said, which is also here, yeah, have some cocaine, have some heroin, have some a bit of a, um, a bit of a, have some uh, amphetamines, or, or which is also or very valuable. Anything, the, 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 uh, but I think if anybody that, had that, said, uh, here, have some those, cocaine, those feelings, have some heroin, I think I would have um, fallen, have some uh, fallen completely into that trap. Or, so I was very lucky. Anything that, that, uh, that would have reduced that worse. Um, those, in my those feelings, I think uh, I would I have did fallen, fallen completely uh, into that trap. <clears> so I was very lucky. Um, I did obviously that uh, meet worse. many girls. Um, um, in my most 20s, of whom uh, I, I did was not very. Uh, <clears throat> I did obviously uh, meet many girls. Um, most of whom I met I many pretty girls to whom I was extremely attracted, very, um, but um, I was not in a position to um, really. Uh, I met many pretty girls to whom I was extremely attracted. I was not. I was not particularly but, in, a, um, in a position to I was not give in the girls to, I liked um, really the sort of good uh, time you need to be able to give somebody else. Um, it I, was not, I was not particularly in a, in a position to give the girls something I that to this day I the sort of good time probably my most you need to be able to give somebody else. It's probably um, the, the memory I culminated least in, happy about, which was something um, that to this in a day meeting I, uh, at work is probably my most difficult. I um, it's probably the I was very strongly attracted to this girl. And I had this thing about, about truth where I thought, was, you, you know, um, you can't in a meeting not tell some work if that's how you feel. Um, I, um, but uh, I was very strongly attracted to this I, girl, and I had uh, this thing about truth where I thought, you, you know, you could, can't. There were many opportunities where I could have. If that's how you feel. You know, opened my um, heart, but uh, honestly, um, I. Uh, uh, could to there were many person, opportunities uh, where I could have, in you know, a way my heart that I honestly will, um, in a way that, um, in a uh, way that causes to that shame. person, uh, but in a way that I, I, will, uh, I ended up in a way that a, meeting, um, uh, a team meeting, uh, obviously in a way that totally causes and, shame. Shame. and, um, and uh, well, shameful. So. Uh, that, I, uh, that was the end I of that ended up declaring uh, in, in due course uh, uh, a team meeting. Obviously, had to uh, leave obviously totally that. inappropriate. Um, and um, and uh, so then, uh, so uh, that after that was the end of that job. Uh, in due time, and, 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 uh, and at this time, I was starting to, to do the writing as well, which is really um, making a difference. So then, um, uh, after a period of time which is really and going and to at this time I'm starting to do the writing period, as well which is period really of girls it was really a huge um, disadvantage because it created a, 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 a barrier I couldn't uh, I couldn't cross which is really over. going to make a difference um, so I throughout did this period, the period the period of girls, girls it was really a huge disadvantage because it created a, 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 a barrier for a short period, period. I cross over but um, but I did and have uh, 
what you might call and those are the sweetest memories in uh, my of the thirties and one and only proper girlfriend I've ever had for a it made a period. huge difference. It, 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 but this whole period was a turning point. Uh, um, those are the sweetest memories as, um, of all. And and although it was only it made a huge months, difference it, um, it, and although period, after it was a turning point that um, you can really have you can treat girls as um, at, and although it was only six months, you couldn't. Um, and although you couldn't afterwards, have a relationship with that, somebody, you couldn't and at really the same have, time close off the most girls, important part of yourself um, to them. Particularly if they wanted children, and you, you were not in a position to give them children, have a so relationship with somebody. That was really and at the, the same time, time close off the most important me. part of yourself to them. But particularly if they wanted children, you know, what, and a, you were what, not a, tremendous, uh, what a what a tremendous what a tremendous. Uh, that was really the one and only time uh, for me. But what a tremendous thing to have those memories to sustain. You know what a tr what a tremendous for, uh, for, what, a, for, what a tremendous uh, uh, period uh, for the period to follow. Then what a tremendous thing to have those me. memories to sustain one plus. Is, you know for 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 a funny thing happened to me when I was forty. For period to follow. I'd always been toned down. Then we get to. Always forty. My, I had class. musical cousins who were gifted, and they used to laugh. A funny at me thing happened to me whenever when I, I opened 40. my mouth to sing because I was I'd so always been totally obviously toned deaf. Always. My, when I was forty, I had musical cousins I suddenly who were gifted, the ability to sing. And they used to laugh at me, and whenever I opened my mouth to sing because I was the same so time, which is painfully obviously toned not this chain of thought that I when I was forty about this, I suddenly this gained the way of ability thinking. to sing. My and something else had my thought process at the same time, which changed. Is that, and it was like Mark, this had. chain of thought that I've that I've talked about. This I, way, this normal way. My, of my thoughts were going round my, in my head. I mean, that's my a, thought that's a, process. That's a good way to suddenly put it. changed, and, and it was like a they cat. would. Whereas before they had, I how my, I my how thoughts I were going it, round in my head. head. Whereas mean, before a, they had jumped out. They had jumped out to be extremely. They would cognitively dissonant, whereas before they uh, had thought thought how I parts. how I understand it now, now how I put it, it now. Was, it whereas felt like before they had jumped like out there was they this had jumped out and then they jumped back in on track cognitively dissonant uh, thought 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 parts now it was it felt like a can it felt like there was this lump and then they jumped back in on track and over and, <clears throat> I mean. That was a, that was a period of time. There was a period of time when it was quite painful to listen to music, and then once I got through that period, and, and over got over, over this came shaft. That was a, that was a period of time. There was a period of time I was quite I was able to sing. To I'm still able to music. sing. It's a and great thing. It's a once I got so through that thing, period. Very handy. And, but what I'm most happy about is that kind of feeling in my head. I thought I was able to sing. It's a great thing. It's a I don't. It's a wonderful uh, thing. I'm very happy. But what I'm most happy I about uh, is that my thought process I, I, I is unrecognisably different now. Across, I don't, through this I don't, period, I turned uh, a corner, and the corner I turned was back to my uh, mental health, having been in some way. I, which I, I don't turned fully a corner. Understand. Across slightly through this period, I turned a corner. Um, the corner I turned was back obviously a long, mental health, obviously a long time, been, but in some way, which I don't fully understand, there's also been a long time since when I've been benefiting um, from being, you know, obviously quite, a long, quite mentally, obviously a long time, um, but mentally secure while I do there's this. There's also been a long time since when I've been, I've been benefiting doing. from being, you know, quite, so, quite mentally um, in my fifties, mentally I secure, while I do this kind of quite ambitious truth work about what I'm doing, and so that was one time when I was in my fifties when I found out the truth about the horrendously unequal distribution the truth about money in the whole world. Over and the course of time, that I was, was one time when I was depressed. Quite depressed, just for a couple of days about the. 
horrendously unequal distribution of wealth in the whole world. It consolidated my anger. Time, it gave I my anger a place to be a long time and so quite depressed. Just really one of the day. reasons why I'm but so much better able to manage for me my cognitive it consolidated states my anger these days it gave is that my I can anger a place switch to that be. anger on and, and off. so just really one reading, of the reasons you know, why I'm so much better able to manage something on the internet my about the, the states about these unfairness days. is that um, I can switch that, sounds, that anger on uh, and off just by sounds, reading um, you know that sounds controlling. On I the don't mean it to sound about controlling. The, I mean, I genuinely about do feel unfair unfair about unfairness. Um, um, that sounds. Uh, that sounds. Um, but you can only fight so many battles. That sounds controlling. It's quite, I don't mean it, it is quite healthy I mean, to be I able to do and choose your battles. About unfairness. And that's really um, what this did for me. It gave me one. But you one can only fight front. so many battles, and it's quite. It is quite healthy and then to be able now, to pick and choose I'm your battles. Getting to the end of my and fifties, that's really what and of course, uh, work-wise, one socially, one I feel front. at the top of my game. I'm equanim. And then we reach now, where I'm getting to I the end of my fifties, and of course, uh, work-wise and uh, socially, and history, I feel at the top of my game. Uh, I'm equanim. You know, all in all, it's yes. it's all turned out right have better equanimity than um, about. The one past I could have expected. and uh, and my history, and uh, you know, all in all, it's it's all turned out rather better than um, the one might have expected.